it was considered one of Paul's greatest and best loved epistles when he wrote Galatians. It is sometimes referred to as the Magna Carta of spiritual liberty and freedom. Back during the days of the Protestant Reformation, it was considered sort of the, the cornerstone of that movement because Luther and his peers could see the fallacies, at least some of the fallacies within Catholicism and that heavy emphasis upon works. And so they would often rely upon Galatians to respond to the abuses within Catholicism itself. Of course, obviously, they went to the opposite extreme from works to faith alone, but it, it obviously impacted the religious world of its day and continues to be felt and influence uh, us in the 21st century. Galatians bears some um, important similarities to two books in the New Testament, uh, 2 Corinthians in particular, because it is very uh, defensive in nature. It is warlike. There aren't any words of commendation. There aren't any words of thanksgiving in prayer. It starts with a rebuke, if you recall, in chapter 1. It is like Romans in that it shares a very similar theme and, a, and, and content. And so sometimes Galatians is actually referred to as a little Romans. It was written somewhere in the early part of Paul's missionary tour, somewhere between A.D. 53 and 57. Not the earliest, but certainly one of the earliest. And it was written specifically to congregations, we believe, in South Galatia. And I'm thinking of cities like, or congregations such as Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And if you get out your Bible map, you can actually look back at the first century and see where those congregations were located and kind of get in your mind's eye of to whom the Apostle Paul was writing and talking to, at least initially. If we think about the purpose of Galatians, the purpose, we discover that a very short time after the Apostle Paul had left those congregations, there were false teachers who had made their influence felt in the church, in those congregations. Uh, when I say false teachers, I'm referring, sometimes you'll hear a gospel preacher refer to a Judaizing teacher. Well, a Judaizer said essentially that a Gentile had to do two things. He had to keep certain elements of the law of Moses, as well as the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Gentile had to undergo the rite, or I-T-E, the rite of circumcision, and keep certain elements of the law of Moses in addition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is frustrated with those congregations because they have so quickly been removed and they have left the faith that he taught them previously. See, the Judaizer said that salvation was by law and by faith. And the way that they were going to undermine Paul's influence is to say, you know what? He really wasn't an apostle at all. And so he spends the first couple of chapters in the book on a very personal level, defending his apostleship. And in so doing, he proves that that message actually came from Jesus Christ and not from his own will. If you have your uh, New Testament open to the book of Galatians, you might want to write this theme if you're in the habit of uh, putting notes in the margin of your Bible. And here in Oxford, I encourage our members to do just that. The theme of Galatians is liberty or freedom in Christ. Liberty in Christ as opposed to uh, bondage under the law of Moses. Now, if you want a brief outline of the book of Galatians, there are three divisions, main divisions. Chapters 1 and 2 are personal in nature. Chapters 3 and 4 are doctrinal in nature. And then chapters 5 and 6 are practical in nature. And obviously, my responsibility is to look at Galatians chapter 5, specifically verse 20. And we're going to be doing that uh, momentarily. I, I want to take a few minutes, however, and, and, and beg your indulgence and spend a little bit of time in what I'm going to call a jet tour over Galatians chapters 1 through 6. And you may be thinking to yourself, now Mike, you've been given this assignment of one particular verse of Scripture. Why 
why give us the overview? Why, why do this jet tour? And the obvious, uh, honest answer is that it's, it's, it's easy sometimes to cherry pick certain words and verses. A and from my experience, it is best if we get the context. And once we understand the context uh, of the scriptures, then when we go to these passages, we understand why the Apostle Paul said what he did. Uh, I don't know if you like to fly. I, there are elements of flying that I enjoy. I like takeoff. Uh, I like being able to, to move quickly across the United States. Uh, and I like to be able to look out of the plane down to the ground and see where I am. Well, that's essentially what we're going to do in a very hurried uh, way. I don't like turbulence. I don't know anybody who really enjoys turbulence. I don't know anybody who, uh, you know, says to the steward or the stewardess, L listen, go up and, and see the pilot and ask him if he could do that again. But we're going to see turbulence, obviously, in Galatians chapter 5. And when we look at uh, hatred and contentions uh, this evening, I want to give you a more detailed overview, a jet tour very quickly. In chapter 1, if you have your Bibles open with me, beginning at verse 6, he said, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him, Jesus Christ, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some, Judaizing teachers, verse 7, who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's exactly what's happening. Keep part of the law of Moses keep part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And so point number one is not all news is good news. Uh, they were being taught a false doctrine. But chapter 2, turn with me beginning at verse 11. Chapter 2, he makes the point here that are doing needs to match our saying. Now, here's part of the problem. Uh, Peter has come to be with Gentiles. And you remember Peter was the person in Acts chapter 2. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, watch it, and to your children, watch it, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, he's obviously referring to Gentiles. And eight to ten years later, in Acts chapter 10, you remember he saw the sheet sermon, Rise, Kill, and Eat, and he really struggled with that. But when he meets Cornelius and his family, he suddenly has a revelation, literally. He says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so eight to ten years after he preached that message, it finally comes clear. Well, another eight to ten years later in Galatians chapter 2, he's eating with Gentiles. But when Jews come to the scene, he withdraws himself and stops eating with the Gentiles, because he's afraid. He's concerned uh, about what those individuals might say. And Paul calls him on the carpet. In fact, he rebukes him to his face because 20 years has elapsed and he has been hypocritical. He's been inconsistent because he said the gospel is for everybody, and yet he withdraws from the Gentile. And so our doing needs to meet and match our saying. Chapter 3 the Apostle Paul says, beginning at verse 2, This only I want to learn from you. He asks something of a rhetorical question. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? You hear the warlike emphasis. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now having made perfect or being made perfect in the flesh? Here's what's happening. By going to this quasi-gospel, uh, and taking elements of the law of Moses, uh, they're not progressing, in fact, just the opposite. And so his emphasis in chapter 3 is we can't advance by going backwards, and that's a spiritual lesson for us. Chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, now I say that the heir, stay with me, as long as he is a child does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. 
but is under guardians and stewards until that time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, we were, watch it, in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, verse 4, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive, we might receive, watch it, the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you're a son. Watch it. You enjoy freedom in Christ. You're not a slave under bondage of the law, but you're under freedom as a son, as an heir of God. And that that ought to remind them of where they have been. Now, here's the problem. It's kind of like the guy who gets out of prison. He, he's been guilty of some egregious thing, and he's, he's put in prison behind bars. He's released, and then he goes out, and he steals a pistol and goes out and shoots somebody, and he's put back into prison. Well, that's spiritually speaking what's happening to the congregations when they, when they accept this, this uh, polluted gospel that the Judaizers were teaching. They're essentially taking the pistol and going back into the old beggarly ways and they're trying to find salvation in elements of two different laws or two different systems or two different economies. If you look in the book of Hebrews, you remember that a, um, a testament, a law, a will, goes into effect after the death of the testator. Well, the law of Moses was in effect. Jesus died on Calvary's cross. He offers us salvation by faith, by obedient faith, through him. And that's exactly what Paul was trying to do. And they were going back into slavery, ironically, rather than enjoying the blessings and freedom of being uh, sons of Jesus Christ. If you skip over to chapter 6, read with me verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so lesson number Six or chapter number six, perhaps I should say, is that broken brethren need to be mended. It's, the reference there is actually to mending a broken bone. And spiritually speaking, when folks fall away, it's the responsibility of the leadership, of the shepherds of the church to lead, but the rest of the congregation to also follow in long, along and uh, and to restore this individual. Now, let's go to chapter 5, because that's where our emphasis is today. And here's the main point of Galatians chapter 5, and that is that liberty, remember the theme is liberty in Jesus Christ, freedom in Christ, the Magna Carta. Liberty, listen, is not a license. Read with me in Galatians chapter 5, and we'll begin reading at verse 13. For you, brethren, he's talking to the churches, these congregations, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Now think about what he's saying here. But through love serve one another. For all the law... Moses is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself or as one another. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 13, but through love serve one another and all the law is fulfilled in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's verse 14, verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest any of you be consumed by another. Now watch what he has been saying all along. He's, a pro, he's opposed to the slavery of the Old Covenant. He's obviously saying you don't go back that way. He is commending them to sonship with its freedom in Christ Jesus. But some brethren misunderstood they're being led astray by these Judaizing teachers. And he says here at verse 13... Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity. Now, this word opportunity in the Greek language refers to a base operations for war. And, and here's, here's what's happening is that these members of the church who understood some semblance of the idea of liberty and freedom said, well, if I have freedom, then I have unlimited freedom 
to do whatever I want to do. You know, virtually every teenager that I know looks forward to the day when they can get a driver's license to drive so that they can get behind the wheel and travel to where they want to travel. Having said that, because they have that, that license, does that mean they can drive anywhere that they want to go? And the obvious answer, or does that mean they can drive as fast as they want to go? And the obvious answer is no, they can't. And here is probably part of the reason the Judaizing teachers are teaching what they're saying. They're saying, you know what, if we pull all law away, if we do away with the law of Moses, there's going to be moral chaos. This is, you know, a very paganistic world at that particular time, not unlike what we're facing right now. And so they say, if you pull away the law of Moses, then, then there is a lack of restraint. Well, now, wait a minute here. Even freedom has certain limits. I'm probably less than three miles from Oxford City Park. I can get in the car and be there or my truck in a relatively short period of time. It's free. Uh, taxes pay for that. There's not a sign that says this park is free, but you understand that there's not any sort of payment that has to be made to park and to walk around and to use the facilities there. But it's, for example, there's a lot of land there at the park. Does that mean that I can just do whatever I want to? And I don't, you know, I like to garden. Would it be okay if I just started, you know, bring my rototiller and started breaking up the ground? Or uh, could I start using that property for my own personal benefit and my own personal financial advantage? You would say, well, it's a free park. It's free to all the citizens in Alabama. But that doesn't mean that I have a license to do whatever I want to do. Well, as Christians, we are free in Jesus Christ, but that does not license us to live however we want to live. Now, here's, here's part of the great dilemma and why I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to, to study this passage together with you. Does law force people to do right. See, what the law of Moses did is it defined what error was. It defined what sin was. In fact, he, uh, Paul the Apostle said, I had, not, I had known what covetousness was unless the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So it defined law. It said there was a... It, it, it defined it said there were consequences when an individual sinned, but there was no freedom. There was no liberty, if you please. It didn't cause or force or make anybody to, to live as they should. See, law can't do that. And I wish people could understand that principle. See, the only thing that can cause me to do right is watch it. It's, according to Galatians chapter 5, I, I'm to walk in the Spirit. I'm to, I'm to set my mind on spiritual things. Uh, someone says, well, you know what? We need, we need moral and racial justice today. Let me speak very candidly and carefully. Does the presence of speed limit signs stop people from speeding? Does the fact that it's against the law to steal stop people from stealing? Does the law that says it's against, you know, it's wrong to murder stop people from murdering? And the only thing, the only thing that will help us to do that is the gospel of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Only the love of Jesus can change our hearts. And, and that's the irony of the Judaizing teacher is he was appealing to the law and law would define what was error and was wrong and said there were consequences, but it didn't give freedom. And so I want you to notice here as we look at these verses, verse 15, 
Well, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another, which is exactly what was happening then and which I, I, I might add is often happening in our society uh, today. See, the Galatians misunderstood. They accepted this false, Judaizing, works-oriented gospel. Their focus was on the law. It was on the flesh, and a fleshly focus leads to fleshly sins. See, law-keeping produces a church that says, you know what, we've got to be right on a hundred, on 10,000 different points of minutia an opinion, and it tends to divide us because it is very, very exclusive. In fact, it's more exclusive than Jesus. But license, unchecked license, uh, some would refer to it as liberalism, produces a church that doesn't have any distinctiveness whatsoever because everything is gray, everything is relative, and it's more inclusive than Jesus is. And so Paul is trying to point out here, don't fall into the trap of these Judaizing teachers. You can only be under one law at a time. So let's look for a few moments here. Let's, let's slow down if we could and look at verses 19. And, well, let's back up to verse 16 if, if we could. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, they're obvious, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery. Here's where we're supposed to be, hatred. Let me just ask some rhetorical questions, and you think about this and pray about this, practice this. Is hatred good? You say, well, obviously not. What's the word hatred here in the original language? It actually means enmity. It refers to hostility. In fact, a, an intense hostility that that I feel toward another individual. If you go back in your Bibles earlier in the New Testament to Luke chapter 23, you discover this odd little tidbit of information, how that Pilate and Herod were actually enemies up until the time of cru the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They had hostility towards one another. And that's the picture here uh, of the word that he's using here in verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. It it actually pictures enemies in military conflict, but specifically in the New Testament, it refers to personal enemies. And here's the, the reality that many fail to understand and appreciate. See, hatred is spiritual acid. Now, you think about acid. If I pour it on something, it damages, it hurts, it eats away at something else. But that which is holding the acid is also often destroyed by that. And that's exactly what hatred does. Hatred, you know, sometimes people say, well, where does hatred come about? I don't know if I have it here in my, my desk. I, I used to keep some S&H green stamps. When I was a little boy, Mama would go to the grocery store when we lived in Ohio. And she would buy groceries, and she'd get so many stamps, green stamps, for buying the groceries. And you licked those stamps, and you put them in a page of a book. And when you filled a book full of stamps, you could redeem that and get gifts. And what sometimes happens in our homes and in our work and in our congregations, and yes, certainly in the world today, is that people are angry, they're upset, and so rather than dealing with the pain and the angst and the anger that they experience, they save that up, and they save that up, and they save that up, and then eventually they cash that in. 
you know, if you've ever gone to your refrigerator, you've been on vacation for the week, and you come home and you open up the refrigerator and there's, man, there's something that's just take your breath away. Well, what do you do? If you're like Mike Benson, you, uh, you, you, you close the refrigerator. But if you're like most women, you open up the refrigerator and you try to find out the offending member, what has gone bad. Well, that's what hatred is. Hatred is that we, it's, it's anger that's gone to seed that hasn't been dealt with. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, save it up. No. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. And, and so obviously, in this list here, we need to listen very carefully to what the Apostle Paul says. Now, I want to stop for just a minute. Because he says here in verse 19, the works of the flesh, hatred, is a work of the flesh. And then if you drop down to verse 21 momentarily, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you before in time past, listen, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is a side note. This is for free. It's not even in my notes. But here is a passage that proves the possibility of apostasy, of falling away. He's writing to members of the church, and he says, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you have hatred in your heart and we don't repent of it, we'll be lost. You know, maybe you haven't thought about it in these terms, but, uh, you know, the very first home had hatred. Cain killed his brother Abel. Joseph had brothers who were so jealous of him that they sold him into slavery, took his coat of many colors, dipped it in animal blood, and gave their daddy the false impression that he'd been, you know, he'd been mauled by a wild animal. They hated him so much that they treated him as though he was dead. Stephen, when he's preaching the gospel, is actually accosted by what is the equivalent of the Supreme Court in the first century, the Sanhedrin covers their ears, uh, their ears, they gnash their teeth at him, and they kill him. Why? Because they hate not only the message, but they hate the messenger. Probably somewhere in our, our daily walk, in our congregations, we need to be praying because we're seeing an awful lot of hatred in our society today, and it, it's a frightening time. It's a time where we need to we need to make sure that first and foremost of all that we're not harboring that which Paul condemns that we're not guilty of hatred and even when we not when we don't approve of the actions of those who are creating havoc in society that we don't hate anybody. But notice here also at verse twenty. He says, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. The old King James says variance. Variance is not good. It, it means wranglings. It refers, believe it or not, to, the, to parties that have different platforms, that have different opinions. Parties, not parties as in have a good time, but parties in strife and division. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking of uh, political division and and. Once again, we see that. Well, it's partyism, it's contentions, it's a bitterly mean spirit that is so consumed with its own self-interest that it would rather divide the church or a family or a nation rather than admit error. You remember in First Corinthians chapter 1, it's been declared to me concerning you by those of Chloe's household that there are contentions among you. There's a party spirit. Well, what's happening? I'm of Paul. I am of Cephas. You know, I am of Christ. And then Paul asks those rhetorical questions on purpose. Was I, were you baptized in my name? I wasn't crucified. And so contentions uh, are those, it's that spirit that consumes us. Now watch it. 
uh, somebody's thinking, and I know my time's running out, somebody's thinking to themselves, you know, you know Mike, it, it's appropriate that, that somebody preaches on this. But you don't know how I've been mistreated. And so when I think of them, yeah, I, I, I have hatred. I can hear somebody saying that. Let's look at a few passages briefly before time runs out. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 and just listen to what our Lord says, beginning at verse 21. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, Watch it, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. The Old Testament said that. It defined sin. It said there were consequences of sin. You'll be judged. A life for a life. But I say to you, Jesus said here in verse 22, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says, verse 22, you fools shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you before you take one sup of the Lord's Supper, before you sing one song, before you bow your head in prayer, before you open up your Bible to listen to the sermon, you set all of that down and you get in the car or you pull them aside into a Bible, into a classroom and say, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. I owe you an apology. Verse 24, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother. That means to make friends again. Then come and offer your gift. Watch verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest the adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. There are consequences. Jesus said, I have a responsibility to do what is right when I have done wrong and when others have done wrong to me. And that doesn't mean to let it build up in my heart. To the point that I want to murder them. Romans chapter 12. And we see a similar idea here in Romans 12 beginning at verse 14. Someone says, well, I've never wanted to murder anybody. Well, uh, if you've had hatred in your heart and you, and the opportunity presented itself, that's part of Jesus's point here. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of men. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, be at peace with all men. You know what? I don't feel guilty anymore because I don't necessarily like everybody. I am to love everybody, but I don't approve of everything that a person does. But Paul says, if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably. I do what is right. Their sin does not license me to sin against them. And so watch, watch the lesson that we're learning here from Galatians chapter 5. See, freedom in Jesus Christ, the freedom that we enjoy, never, never gives us a license to sin against others in return, to feel hatred, to be guilty of contentions, I'm to do just the opposite. I'm to, if you back up into Galatians, I'm to walk in the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about what he says there in conclusion. See, walking in the Spirit is not passive. Walking means something has to happen. I'm, I'm moving from one juncture to another. Walk in the Spirit is not some mystical experience as my some of my... Uh, uh, my Pentecostal friends like to say that you're under his 
control and you're out of control. It's, it's not some mystical experience. It is not exchanging the commands of the law for the, for the law of Jesus. Here's the answer. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, the apostle Paul said, for those who live according to the flesh, watch it, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's what's happening in the churches of Galatia. But those who live according to the Spirit, who walk according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit and what he teaches. And when I put on Christ, I say all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. And that includes surrendering, surrendering my will to his will and to loving my neighbor rather than hating my neighbor. It's been a great, grand blessing. I wish I could be with you in, in a physical sense. We want to continue to pray for our church members in particular and all of society and those who are suffering from physical disease, particularly the covid um, 19 right now, but we want to pray more, not for the, not just for the, the, the physical virus, but for the spiritual virus that permeates many hearts today. Let's pray together as we conclude our study. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity to come before your throne. We're thankful for your will and how it guides us to the blessings. We're thankful that we can be called and considered children of God through faith. And we pray, Father, that each day that we'll open our eyes with a renewed zeal to walk in the Spirit and not to harbor animosity and animus in our hearts, but to be loving and forgiving and to be a light in a world that is full of darkness. We're thankful for the ultimate example of Jesus Christ we pray your blessings upon our congregations as we endeavor to be that light. Forgive us, Father, when we sin. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen.